she was fortunately able to figure out what it was and they took an x-ray and where the end of the bone should have been um, nice and round and smooth it was all, all jagged and and it was actually being eaten away the, there was so much inflammation in the shoulder it was actually eating away the end of the bone something called osteolysis which means vanishing bone hi everyone welcome back this is jordan thompson with the perfect workout and today we have a very special feature i sit down with matt hedman our founder and ceo of the perfect workout to talk about his story the origins of the perfect workout and some of the unexpected events that led up to him creating this company that we've been running strong for over 20 years so Stick around if you want to learn about how the perfect workout began, a little bit more about our methodology and the man behind it all. I've been with the perfect workout for a number of years, almost seven years now. And uh, I feel like every time I've had a chance to sit down and talk with you, Matt, there's always some sort of fascinating story. I learn about you <laughs> or your experience with slow motion strength training and, um, and especially your beginnings with it. So I'm really curious, how did you first hear about the method? How did you hear about slow motion strength training and who or what inspired you to get into it? I actually, so I'm 48 years old right now at the time of this recording and for better or for worse. And um, I actually uh, got into lifting weights when I was 10 years old. So I guess if I'm doing my math right, that's 38 years that I've uh, been at this. And um, and uh, so this was somewhere between my fourth and fifth grade uh, year and got uh, bought my own weightlifting set. And I guess I was, I must have been a crazy kid because I now have a nine-year-old son. And so I was <laughs> one year older than him. And I'm, it just doesn't seem normal, you know, for, for, for a child that age to get a weight set. But I did, I was inspired to do that for whatever reason back then. And um, anyway, at that age, I really got into exercise um, all in, like I've been in, 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 in a fitness net, I guess you could, you could say, uh, ever since. And, um, and so between age, uh, age 10 and 20, I um, didn't really have a, uh, I, a good way of going about things. In hindsight, hindsight's always 2020, but I was just kind of haphazardly doing, you know, whatever this was the latest book that I would read or, uh, you know, about exercise or strength training or nutrition. And, and um, and, uh, and by the time I got to age 20, I was, uh, I was uh, lifting weights for two hours a day, six days a week. And uh, so that's 12 hours of uh, lifting weights and exercising per week. And, um, and by that point, I'd, uh, so I was in college at, at this point, and, and I'd uh, actually developed some relatively, uh, uh, well, some chronic uh, uh, pain in my left shoulder. It was bad enough to where I went and saw a shoulder specialist. And uh, she was able, she was fortunately able to figure out what it was. And they took an x-ray and where the end of the bone should have been um, nice and round and smooth. It was all, all jagged and, and it was actually being eaten away. The, there was so much inflammation in the shoulder. It was actually eating away the end of the bone, something called osteolysis, which means vanishing bone. And, um, and the, the joint specialist, she said, uh, yeah, that this happens in about 1% of people that lift weights, although I think I've only met one other person in my life that's had uh, this condition. And, um, but the, uh, she said, well, I want you to take uh, two months off of any, any weight training ex exercise which involve the shoulder, and uh, then we'll come back in an x-ray um, again and see, you know, see how it is. So I did, and I still did some exercise for my legs and even some for my arms, just as long as they didn't involve my shoulder directly. And, um, and so I came back in uh, after the two months and they took another x-ray. And fortunately, um, the end of the bone in question was now all nice and round and smooth again. It had, had, had healed, which is good news because sometimes it doesn't heal from rest. And, uh, and I avoided surgery. And, um, and so then she essentially said, okay, you can go back and lift weights again. And she had some minor changes as far as what to do. It was uh, to do, you know, incline uh, bench presses instead of flat bench presses and some other kind of uh, what I would consider in hindsight minor changes. And um, so I went in and did those changes and started, you know, throwing the weights around in the gym again. And, um, and my shoulder just started to hurt again, which was, you know, disturbing and frustrating. And, uh, and it's not like, you know, I was 20 years old, you know, presumably, you know, someone who'd be uh, young and healthy and, you know, have the best opportunity to not have joints that would hurt, you know? Yeah. And uh, so it was, it was right around that time when I was, when I was you know, starting to, to get back into, or, or starting to do exercises that involved the shoulder again, and it started to hurt again, where I stumbled upon a book 
um, in one of the bookstores in the, in the university district up in Seattle at the University of Washington, where I was going to college at the time. Um, by, and it was a book by Ellington Darden, um, who, uh, who used to be the director of research, the director of research at Nautilus, um, the company that makes straight train machines. And, um, and he's written about 50 books, I think, at this point on strength training, nutrition, fitness, and exercise. And uh, anyway, this particular one was geared towards y young males who wanted to build bigger muscles. And uh, I was a 20 year, old, 20 year old male, you know, trying to build bigger muscles as best I could. And, um, and one of the chapters, he spent a significant amount of time talking about how slower movement speeds minimize impact forces on your joints and make it safer on your joints. And so that kind of, you know, perked up my eyebrows a little bit. And I mean, it, in hindsight, it's obvious, but it wasn't obvious to me at that point. Sure. And, um, and so, uh, but, but the routines in this book sounded bizarre to me because at the time I was loosely following the exercise guidelines and Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding. And so I was doing five sets of, uh, of repetitions of, um, uh, you know, five sets of 10 repetitions or so of each exercise, working out two hours a day, six days a week. And in, in some cases, working out in the morning and in the evening. And um, like a part-time job. Yeah. Well, you know, I was in college. I didn't, I didn't know how much <laughs> exercise that was. Right. <laughs> like now with being 48 and two young children and trying to, you know, grow our company and all that kind of stuff. It's like, who would ever have time for that? But at the yeah. time I had time for it. And, um, and so, uh, but this, this routine that jarred down his book was uh, that routine. It was working out every other day. It was about a half an hour per workout, just one set of repetitions per exercise going very slowly, 10 seconds up, five seconds down in that particular protocol. Um, and uh, as thinking, well, gosh, you know, would this ever work? Um, but fortunately, there was uh, a, a case study in that book that they featured, uh, uh, Keith Whitley, who um, over the six week program, he was already a big bodybuilder to start out with. And over the six week program, he gained, I think it was 32 pounds of muscle in 42 days or something like that. Wow. And, um, and that combined with the, the uh, you know, the fact that my was having this you know, kind of pretty, pretty big uh, uh, shoulder problem. It thought, it thought, well, and it might be better for my shoulder. I thought, well, why not give it a try? And so I was, uh, and I'm glad that I did <laughs> because- um, We are too. <laughs> for, for, me, for me personally, I, I actually haven't trained a client myself who's done as well as, as far as muscle gain, at least, um, with the initial uh, results that I had. But I put on uh, 10 pounds of muscle in the first nine days. Uh, once I learned how to make my muscles work harder, <laughs> uh, the uh, I didn't know what you know. I I thought I was working hard before when I was working out two hours a day, six days a week. It turns out I just didn't know what hard work was, <laughs> and um, and so I, I put on 10 pounds of muscle in nine days, and then also my shoulder problem went away within about the first week or so, um, and then essentially not to be heard from again. You know, you know, ever since, and so I've been a raving fan of this method ever since. And so that's how my, uh, and so we've been personally doing this and variations of, you know, of this in my own workouts for the last 28 years, I guess it is. And um, yeah, and then, I'll, you know, I was studying engineering at the time and, uh, you know, graduated, went to work for GE as an engineer and saw my life flashing before my eyes on the second floor of building J on the GE complex. And, uh, and it wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. And so I quit after 11 months there at GE and started working at, at the company, which is now 24 Hour Fitness, and um, worked for them and another company for a total of three years before starting the Perfect Workout back in May of 1999. And, um, and so that's when our company started. And So what uh, happened between well, you leaving your engineering job and starting the Perfect Workout? There must have been a lot of learning, a lot of training, a lot of yep. um, probably paradigm shifts still in, in terms of exercise. So yep. what did that transition look like? So, so my degree was actually in aerospace engineering uh, from the University, University of Washington. And I was actually working for GE Nuclear Energy in San Jose um, was my, you know, kind of engineering, it was my engineering job that I got out of college. And, um, and so as I mentioned, I, 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 what you know for during my first 11 months they're just realizing oh, this is just not my passion I, I wanted it's not what i want to do with my life and so i started putting out feelers to different gyms as far as what it would take to become a a, a personal trainer and um and in that during that process 
what is now 24 Hour Fitness at the time in the Bay Area, it was 24 Hour Nautilus it was, it was the company. And um, I, they, they actually gave me a job offer to come on, even though I didn't have any formal education in exercise or any formal experience in exercise, I, I always say they, they must have recognized uh, the strength of my engineering personality. That's what that must, <laughs> must have carried the interview there. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I got hired on without any, any formal credentials at that point. Uh, but having said that, when I did, um, then I started acquiring uh, different certifications in kind of relatively short order. Um, so I got several certifications from you know, what are sort of mainstream fitness organizations like uh, ACE, the American Council on Exercise, and also uh, NASM, NASM, the, what is that, the National Academy of Sports Medicine, mm -hmm. uh, are among those. And then, uh, but also the, the, in my mind, the, the really important ones were the certifications I got through the Super Slow Exercise Guild, which is, which is not in existence anymore, uh, that particular organization. But, um, but th that, uh, Certainly, the vast majority of the value that I got my different um, uh, certifications and, and ed ed education were were through that world, including the certifications that, that i that I got and so um, but and as far as changes in the in kind of how we I, really since pretty much from since I was already using super slow uh, or slow motion high intensity strength training in my own workouts at that point. Um, when I became, when I, when I was becoming a trainer, that's what I started working with my clients on right at 24 hour fitness, um, you know, right out of the gate and then just learn more and more and more about how to apply that to clients more effectively over time. And so then, so you became certified, um, and you're, uh, what is it called? Is it a master super slow? What is it? Finish it I, for yes. me. Yeah, yeah. I was I, I was a master super slow instructor. I think that's what the what the term was. So, back when the super slow exercise guild was in existence, um, which was by the way, the super slow exercise guild was an organization which was um, which was formed by Ken Hutchins, and he ran for I don't know ten, probably a little over ten years. And Ken Hutchins is the uh, is the arch architect behind super slow exercise philosophy and methodology, and um, and so. Uh, there was actually three different levels in, as far as certifications you could go, go through. So there was a level one and that was, um, let's put that the level one super certification was uh, far more, ex far more extensive than any of the other mainstream certifications that I've ever gone through. Um, and uh, they, you, you know, compared to ACE or NASM, which really just took a multiple choice test. And if you scored 70%, you were certified. At least this was, you know, over 20 years ago at this point. So they may be different now, but at, at that point, that's what it was. Um, you know, the super slow level one certification, you had to not only take um, was at least one written test, if not more, and then one or two verbal tests, and also go through an extensive practical examination showing that you were you know, capable of teaching exercise. Um, and so it's many aspects of that certification were really in, in the inspiration for, for what our initial certification program at our company um, became actually. Yeah, and, and uh, I can attest to that. It is, it is a, a lot of work, a lot of hard work, very yeah. hands-on, very practical. So that was, and that was level one. And then so level two involved not only going and doing, you know, some more written testing and, 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 and oral testing, but this was all with Ken Hutchins, uh, which at the time he was in, in Florida, um, and uh, the, you know the gentleman who who uh, uh, really um, put these different theories together, uh, you know, building on the work of Arthur Jones, and then um, but really putting some further refinements to it, and um, and so I spent I think it was nine nine days in 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 Florida in, in the in the Orlando area, shadowing Ken for fourteen hours a day, and then doing various tests uh, while the time that I was there, and so that got me to level two. And then beyond that, um, Ken has the option to appoint you as a master, or Ken had, a, like, uh, had the option of point, appointing to be a master instructor if you passed your level two. And so, um, and so fortunately he did. I guess he felt that I was good enough to represent the guild at the time and to be able to certify other instructors to be level one uh, instructors. So that's, um, yeah, that's, that, that's, that was my journey in the, in the super slow certifications. Yeah, and then so you, headed over to La Jolla in California and essentially started the first location of the perfect workout, right? Yeah. So here's <laughs> the, um, uh, it's, when it's really kind of really the initial birthplace for the idea, at least in my mind, for what is now the perfect workout was back in, um, it was, uh, it was the end of 1996 and early 1997 when I was, uh, when I was, 
working as a trainer at, at 24 Fitness in the Bay Area. That's this first job of mine. And it was the Christmas holidays. And I was up in the Seattle area visiting friends, you know, that, that I'd known from college. And at the time, the only super slow place on the West Coast was uh, up in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was teaching super slow as best I could in just a regular gym, 24 Hour Fitness, with all the music and mirrors and people jumping up and down all around you and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, to me, that was all that I knew. And uh, so I went up and, and, uh, and said, well, if I'm in Seattle, why don't I schedule a time to work out? And, and that would be fun and interesting and potentially you could learn something. And and so I did, and the day came where I was supposed to go in, and there was a huge snowstorm in Seattle. And Seattle's not a place that tends to get tons of snow. Um, they do get a little bit of snow usually every year, but usually it's not too much. You know, it might get you know snow, you know, snow two or three inches one one or two days, and that's it. Anyway, this was I don't know a foot of snow or something like that. I had to go through, and so most businesses were closed. And so I called called in to see if they're open and they're saying, well, I don't know. We're trying to figure that out right now. <laughs> and you know, how long will it take, take to, for you to get here? And my friend actually had a four wheel drive uh, Jeep Wrangler and I asked him and what I don't know, it's 20 minutes or whatever. And so they so said, come on down. And so I did. And, um, and Greg and Greg and Anne Marie Anderson were the, the couple that owned that place. And, um, and so I, after chatting with them for a while, it came down to where I was going to need to to work out. And so, can't, uh, Greg wanted to put me through four exercises. It was uh, the Smith machine squat, the old Nautilus hip and back machine, which was really a, a glute and hamstring exercise, um, weight assisted chin up, and then push up. And so, when 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 we when we were about ready to go on the squat machine, it had a lot less weight than I thought it should have compared to what I was normally using myself. And so I pointed that to Greg and he said, oh, that's good because I thought this is going to be too heavy for you. <laughs> and, um, and I don't like weights that are too light because then you're just, you know, burning for, yeah. you know, minutes and minutes and minutes on end. And so, uh, but anyway, so we, so we, so we get into the machine and start doing slow repetitions. And sure enough, uh, you know, I, 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 it got extremely difficult at about five or six reps in and um, in the next rep or two, I, Got about halfway up and couldn't couldn't com you know, couldn't complete the repetition. You know, I was pushing as hard as I could, and and I was um, you know there was no music going on. There was a blank white wall, wall right in front of me. There was no distractions, and Greg was somewhere behind me. All I could hear was his voice saying, "Keep pushing," and um, and you know coming from out of the ethers, you know so to speak. And uh, and so I kept pushing, and and uh, and then I got to the point where I couldn't even hold it up anymore. Even I was trying to make it go higher, but I got to the point where I couldn't even hold it still, and sort of started force forcing me down and um Craig just said keep pushing so I kept pushing and it forced me down all the way till the bar hit the safety stops at the bottom oh and he says keep pushing <laughs> and so I so I I uh I kept pushing and um <laughs> and then and then my knees started vibrating to you know vi vibrating together and um and Greg just said keep pushing oh my gosh and, that sounds like torture <laughs> oh it's tough and uh and then, by the way, do not do this. In fact, I don't even recommend doing this anymore. We just didn't know any better back then. Yeah. This, is, this is much harder than a person needs to train for optimal results. But the, um, uh, so anyway, my knees were vibrating. And my knees, my legs fatigued so much that they stopped vibrating, even though I was pushing as hard as I could. And then Greg just said, keep pushing. Oh and then finally, Greg said, okay, 15 more seconds. Push as hard as he can. So I pushed as hard as I could for 15 more seconds. <laughs> and and uh, and finally he said, okay, you, you can, you can, uh, you can uh, back off, and and so I did, and it'll, it'll be hard to hard to illustrate here for those that are listening, or even on the people that might watch this video. Um, but anyway, on the Smith machine, it was up sitting on the on the safety pegs, and so I pulled myself underneath the safety peg, and then um, and then using the bar there. Uh, so I, I, I tried to stand up. So both with my legs and my arms, I was trying to like you know push and pull myself up. And I, I tried once, it, it couldn't stand up. You know, my late, it's too fatigued. So I tried, tried to get, I tried to get harder. It couldn't stand up. I tried to try it again. It, it was just, it wasn't able to stand up. And and um, there was just nothing left. I was, I was uh, too momentarily fatigued. And so Greg, Greg, um, Greg, Greg said, "Don't even try to stand up. Crawl to the next machine." And so by this time, I'm gasping for air after like you know taking squats to that point of the point of exhaustion, which I just uh, explained and crawl to the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Nautilus hip and back machine and he straps me in there and we go through that and that was brutal in and of itself. And we did the, the uh, weight assisted chin up um, and then the push up and, and he, I think he did an assisted rep at the end of that one too and that was really tough. And so I was, uh, finally, 
after four exercises, it was done. But I was, you know, laying on the ground and my arms were just uh, just burning. And Greg, you know, brought me this tiny little like two ounce cup of water, and um, and and it was incredible. <laughs> like, in other words, <laughs> if I if I if I compare my experience of doing that compared to what I was trying to do with myself and my clients back at Twenty Four Fitness. I mean, it was night and day as far as the distraction-free environment and the, the incredible equipment, the low friction equipment that you had access to and, and, um, and the expert instruction, you know, that uh, with, with, it, was just, uh, it was just amazing. And so, um, and so that's when I really got, you know, hey, you know, I could make a place like this down in, Southern, you know, down in California. And, um, and ultimately it turned out to be Southern California where we, where we got started. Um, but that was really that night. Uh, it was uh, I, I, I was I was actually going ski, skiing with my, with friends the next day. But that night I was only able to sleep for about two hours because I was so excited about uh, the idea of, of of making an ideal exercise environment that myself and, and clients could work out in yeah, here in California. And uh, and so that's where it got where the initial idea got started. And then it was a process of still working at, at, at um, 24 hour. And then I uh, actually went up to ideal exercise and worked with them for a year and a half before moving to, down to Southern California yeah, at, and, um, and had a short stint at 24 hour fitness before I opened up the, the perfect workout uh, down here. So I've never heard that story before and okay. what a cool story. And it, <laughs> It, I always thought that the distraction-free, you know, clinically controlled environment was just part of the protocol. And, and I know that it's in some ways it is, um, but I never knew that you had such a personal experience in, oh, yeah. in that. And that's, that's what's created much of the, the environments here. Um, for those who are watching the video, you know, that's uh, one of our studios behind you. And sure enough, it's machines and a blank wall. And it really does make all the difference when you are pushing to get every last yeah. like inch of that repetition and by the way that sounded like torture because trying to push yeah. for three or five seconds at muscle failure is yeah. challenging enough <laughs> well yeah, like 30 yeah and actually i should mention i briefly mentioned while i was telling you a story but maybe just expand on it a little bit more you see i don't recommend <laughs> Uh, push well so a, if a person wants to, to, to fatigue as deep as I just described more power to them but in my experience on myself and working with other people um, as long as you can fatigue down to what we call muscle success in our company or some people call it muscle failure fatigue down to where you're pushing or pulling on, on the exercise as hard as you can and it won't move anymore even though you're pushing as hard as you can that's enough to stimulate optimal results uh, from what I've seen. And, and if it was worth it to push beyond that, I, I would keep doing it because I'm trying to, you know, even though I'm 48 years old, I'm still, you know, excited to, 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 to do what I can to add more muscle on my, on my body. Um, and, uh, but it just doesn't, need, it, it, you don't have to go <laughs> as crazy as, <laughs> as, as we did back, back then because we just didn't know any better back then. Yeah, so, so then it's May 1999. And is that, that's officially when La Jolla opened up, right? The mm -hmm. first, first location. Mm -hmm. And what I really love is that, you know, you started off like 95% of the people who work for the perfect workout as a personal trainer in this company. Oh, yeah. And I'm so curious if you have, whether it's from when you were training one-on-one uh, -on -one with clients or all the 20 years we've been in business, 20 plus years, do you have a favorite client success story uh yes uh so the the one that i um that always sticks out to me when people ask me that question is actually um a, a client of john durbin i don't know did, was john working uh, for us whenever down in san diego that doesn't whenever, sound familiar yeah, to me yeah. maybe he, he worked for us for about five years great guy and um and so and john actually it's too bad he didn't meet him because he's uh and maybe he will someday <laughs> um, he is the leanest as far as, as far as body fat percentage of, of any person I have ever met. Um, and so we, we, he, he got on a DEXA scan here in, in, in San Diego and, um, and he wasn't dieting or, you know, trying to get into bodybuilding shape or anything like that. He was just walking around like this. They measured him at, at 3% body fat. And they said, this is the lowest we've ever seen this machine weigh. So, so if you look at the skin, like, like his, his abs, 
there's less, but it's, it's, it's tighter on his abs than the skin on the back of your hand. I mean, it's just, it's just, it was just crazy. And um, so uh, the, but anyway, so that, that that's John. And, um, and so John, uh, when he tells this story about this client, Barbara Nass, that, 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 uh, that he was working with, um, is uh, he said, you know, when I first became a personal trainer, I thought my, um, uh, my, my, the thing which I was going to be most excited about was going to help someone gain a whole bunch of muscle or, or lose a bunch of fat or something like that. But, um, but it was actually this story with Barbara Nass, which I'm going to you give, you give my um, paraphrasing of, of the way John, uh, I heard John tell the story. And uh, so Barbara, she, and I might get some details wrong, but she was actually featured in our newsletter a number of years ago as well. And I think she was a, a cancer survivor. She might have also been, I know she was at least a grandmother, might have even been a, a great grandmother. And um, I think also had MS. Um, she had uh, multiple different conditions which were going on. And she, she was able to walk, but, but she needed to use a cane, a cane to walk. And, um, and I think she was training with us once a week, and, and uh, if I remember correctly. And, and I'm not sure which day of the week it was. It was like Friday or Saturday or whichever day. And, and John um, used, to, used to say he could, always, he, he could always hear when Barbara was coming in because he could hear the, the, the clacking of the cane you know, coming down the hallway before she opened the door and, and came in. And, um, and there, was, <laughs> there was one day where she was supposed to come in and there wasn't any clacking of the cane. <laughs> and the reason was because she didn't need to use her cane anymore. In other words, she was able to, you know, to get strong enough to where um, the cane was no longer necessary. And, um, and so, and John, I've seen him tell the story before and just the look of satisfaction on his face and saying, that saying what I said earlier, like I thought it was my biggest success was gonna be someone gaining 20 pounds of muscle or losing 50 pounds of fat or whatever. But that was the most, probably the most satisfaction that I've had is, you know, hearing her walk down the hallway without the, ta the clicking of the cane. And we've been fortunate as a company to have, this doesn't happen to everybody, but uh, a fair amount of, I mean, I, I've heard about, you know, I, I don't know if I've heard directly about a dozen, but it's, it's been, you know, at, at, at least a handful mm -hmm. of clients who've been able to get rid of their canes. And that's, well, I mean, that's a huge quality of life issue. So, so that's what, what comes to mind when you ask the question. Yeah. Did you know when getting into fitness and particularly slow motion strength training that it would have such a positive effect on people's quality of lives and their overall health and not just simply their strength? That's a good question. Um, well, when I, <laughs> this, the, the uh, I'm kind of chuckling because this not, might not you know, be the, the, uh, the answer that you're <laughs> expecting, but when when I became a personal trainer, um, I did it really because I'm just so interested in exercise. And it was just like, hey, this is, it, it, you know, I got my degree in engineering, engineering and had just gotten, um, and it was, it, was, it was doing exercise just as an avocation, not thinking of it as a potential vocation. It was just something that I loved to do. And, um, and so when I was at GE working as an engineer and thinking, well, this is not what's going to make me happiness and fulfillment for the rest of my life what well what other ideas are there and it, for whatever reason at that point it occurred to me that there are people that are personal trainers that get to you know work in the gym all day long and you know be around exercise talking about exercise with people you know sort of you know living eating breathing exercise ideas and concepts and applications and and um so it was really just my just interest it, because I mean, this might not be, it might not be the greatest to story, but back then, and again, I was, to, you know, it, and also to give context, I think I was 23 um, when I made the switch into personal training. And, and for, at least for males, my understanding is the prefrontal cortex doesn't fully develop until age 25. So this is without <laughs> a fully developed prefrontal cortex. I wasn't you know, getting into it thinking, Hey, I'm going to, you know, you, you know, make a huge difference on a lot of people's quality of lives. It was just cause, Hey, I, I love this stuff and I want to, um, you know, I just want to be around it and, and, and actually, you know, get paid for it too. So, yeah. well, did um, you ever have that maybe not moment or when did you realize that this was bigger than that though, that, you know, we, we really were helping people in such, such a big way. Yeah. And, uh, and, and by the way, the, um, just as a, I'll answer that question in a second, <laughs> but I, I will have to mention that, 
in my mind, you know, building bigger muscles and losing fat is, is incredible too. Like in other words, so like, I, like I'm not saying that, you know, like, you know, uh, getting stronger or even walking is necessarily like, uh, or an intrinsically a, a superior goal to building, you know, 20 pounds of muscle. It just, I mean, it depends on the person and what they want and all that kind of stuff, you know? So, and what's important to them. I would say probably when I was working at ideal exercise up, um, up in Seattle, like after, after I, um, you know, had the initial stint at 24 hour and then was working for them for a year and a half. There was a number of people with MS that we worked with up there. And um, one woman in particular who, um, who, who uh, need, needed to use a walker to walk. And, um, and even then she could barely walk even with a walker. Um, uh, but she, she told, she told us, if, if it wasn't for the strength training she was doing with us, um, she wouldn't be able to walk at all. And so, yeah, it was probably then where it started to, started to, started to, I, you know, started to notice, you know, you know, some of those kinds of things more than I, more than I did before. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah. And yeah. Maybe it was, yeah, maybe it was my prefrontal cortex finally, you know, forming somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> what about you personally? I mean, obviously you've gotten stronger. Um, mm -hmm. You have, uh, significant amount of muscles like you've got a fantastic physique and one would think that being the oh, thank you yeah yeah <laughs> you're welcome i mean everyone talks about your your biceps matt they're like <laughs> they're like <laughs> out of this world um but how has super slow slow motion strength training um improved well i guess in addition to your physical fitness but also your overall health if I hadn't stumbled upon, up, stumbled upon slow motion uh, strength training back back when I did back in 1992, um, I don't know if I would have been able to continue strength training because I mean this was a serious issue in my in my left shoulder, and um, you know with throwing the weights around and just the impact forces involved with that, I, I just don't know if I would have been able to find a good way of working around it. And I so which is tough for me to wrap my mind around like what would I have done? I, I, maybe I would have found a way around it. I, I'm not sure. But, but the, my first answer to the question is that it allowed me to strength train. <laughs> Whereas it, like the way that I was doing before, it just wasn't gonna, it just wasn't gonna keep working because it was just, it was eating away bones in my, in my body, which sounds crazy, but that was, I uh, mean, that that's what was happening. And, um, and so so that's number one is being able to, to, to strength train at all. And number two, to actually get significantly better results from my strength training um, compared to what I've been doing before. So for me, when you ask about kind of my, my, my fitness, you know, getting more muscle, getting, increasing my lean muscle tissue um, and also, you know, the metabolic rate to some degree because of more muscle tissue and helping to get leaner. Um, those would, uh, be a big deal and also in my lower body I, I you know spend most of my time when i tell my sort of origin story about uh about my left shoulder but my my knees have been tricky ever since i was a child and i was never really able to i never really felt safe you know pushing really hard with my legs because my knees just were tricky for lack of a better way of putting it and um and with with slow motion high intensity strength training um, I was able to, you know, I was able to do that story that I just, that I told a few minutes ago about you know taking the squats to what we call muscle success or like some people that are diehards and high intensity we call you know deep muscular failure, and um, and, and so it allowed me to to uh, you know train my legs much more effectively than I did before. So um, so for me, I've been able to get more muscular than, than I otherwise than, than I otherwise was, and and still and still actually able to able to strength train and also. Um, become leaner, and so those are things which me personally you know, turn me on as far as in my pursuits of exercise, and um, and then although these weren't my primary goals and probably still aren't my primary goals, um, I was able, I've been able to get pretty strong, you know, and uh, and my you know what cardiovascular fitness is you know, is, is pretty good. I mean, I might not, you know, be the same thing as an elite marathon runner, but, but it's pretty good as a result of strength training because a lot of people, you know, don't realize that strength training, if you do it effectively, can actually have significant positive benefits in the cardiovascular system. Mm -hmm. And, um, so yeah, that's for me. And then as far as, um, oh, and the, the other piece too is, and I, I guess I alluded to this a little bit in, 
very early in our conversation here is uh, you know the difference between a college kid and how much time there was available uh, available for for doing whatever you want in hindsight versus uh, you know forty years old got a nine year old son a six year old daughter you know wife trying to spend time time and energy with them and trying to work on growing our company and and all that and it's you know I half jokingly half serious talk about you know I run a company where we specialize in time efficient exercise and I have trouble fitting in 20 minutes twice a week. <laughs> and I do, I, I do fit in 20 minutes twice a week, but it's, um, uh, you know, but it's, but it's, I mean, honestly, it's not easy. <laughs> so I, so I understand where everybody's coming from, even someone like a fitness net like myself. So there's that. And then, and then I do dabble in it's some other sort of recreational activities. Like uh, if, cause if somebody really presses for me, like I, <laughs> I dabble in surfing and dabble in snowboarding, but really, those are really dabbling. I think I snowboard maybe an average of, of two two days a year if I'm lucky, and um, and surfing. I mean, I hate to say it because I, I I do enjoy surfing, but it's, but it's been months since I've been out in yeah. the water. But but in other words, if it, those would be the sort of physical activities where people would say, well, where does it make a difference? It's like, well, they, it definitely by being stronger and and better conditioning definitely makes a difference in those uh, in those activities for me. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned your family a couple times. Um, mm-hmm. and I know, I know your wife, Julie, she mm-hmm. does a slow motion strength training. Um, and uh, it's funny cause I, I remember you saying, uh, one time that you don't train each other, right? Or, or right. you don't train her. <laughs> Just right. That's off the table. I want to stay married. I don't want her to hate me for all the pain <laughs> that I'd be putting her through for, you know, putting through an exercise routine. Yeah. <laughs> Stuff. Um, does anybody else in your family, um, do the perfect workout or do slow motion strength training? Have you been able to turn them to the dark side, so to speak? <laughs> yeah. So certainly the one, um, and, and actually, you know, to some degree or other, you know, different members of my family, like immediate family and even extended family have, are either doing it or, or at least I've played with it uh, over the years. And, um, and I can't keep track of everyone in my extended family, but the, uh, um, but my mom is probably the, the, uh, a good a good one to talk about in this conversation um because she is uh well, she's she's 77 today but tomorrow she's going to be 78 <laughs> and um and and her mother uh, actually died from complications due to osteoporosis and so it, it sounds um well what, what happened was uh my grandmother my mom's mom um you know, had osteoporosis and, uh, you know, she started getting, as she got older, she started getting kyphosis in her, her spine, which is when you start to get hunched over and uh, the kyphosis got, you know, progressively worse and worse and worse and worse and worse the older that she got. And by the time that she was in her early to mid eighties, it was, it was, uh, well, at least by the mid eighties, it was so much kyphosis that it was, um, reducing the amount of oxygen she was able to get because you know c- kind of like you know collapsing her chest cavity too much because of the bones just being too soft and and um i you know i should also preface this because some other members of my family might listen to it and this is my understanding of the way my mom has explained it to me and so if i get any details wrong uh, to any of my extended family members i apologize i'm just giving my best uh, understanding of, of what happened here and um, and eventually it got to the point where she couldn't breathe effectively and so that's, um, and I'm not, and, and so, so at least the way that I interpreted the different things uh, um, that, that, that surrounded her death, I think she died at age 86 or so. Mm-hmm. Um, it was basically, I'm not sure if this is the immediate cause of death when she actually died, but, but it was certainly influenced by, or maybe even caused something to happen where uh, she just wasn't able to, to breathe enough because of too much kyphosis from osteoporosis in her spine, just hunching over and over and over, which sounds hard to believe but um it was severe kyphosis and so um so my grandmother she had uh one son but five daughters including my mom and uh, so so i've got four aunts on that side of the family and and, and then i've got my mom and all all five of them are you know uh very concerned i'd say certainly some of them if not all them petrified Mm -hmm. to um end up the, the same way that their mother did and so um each one of them is uh, you know kind of doing different things that that that, that they th- think can help with uh, osteoporosis, and um, including my mom and uh, and and one of my, and I know one of my aunts at least over there maybe more than one, 
uh, did super slow for, for a while, might still be doing it. Um, and, uh, but my mom, yeah, she's been doing strength training and super slow, um, including at our Mission Valley studio here uh, recently for, gosh, a number of years, actually. And, um, and so, so, yeah, so she, she's, 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 a, she's a good example of that. That's awesome. So. And she's doing virtual training from what I, yeah. I know, too. Yeah, because I don't know when, you know, different people might be hearing this podcast or video cast uh, um, at different times. But yeah, we're here in uh, kind of in the sort of the middle of the COVID crisis of 2020 and, and uh, sort of doing virtual training with a number of our, uh, quite a few of our clients. And so my mom is doing that too. Yeah. I think it's important to, to point out here too, that a lot of people who may be new to the method is how impactful slow motion strength training can be on uh, increasing bone density or, or for anyone who has a concern about that. And is that, um, was that ever in the back of your mind when, when, um, I guess building this business is knowing that you had a family history and like knowing, or <laughs> were you just all in because this was great exercise? Yeah. Well, to be <laughs> the truth be told is it, I was all in cause I just it gave me better results. It was yeah. safer in my joints. You know, it was all the benefits that we often talk about. I've certainly paid a lot more attention to, the um you know the the bone density impacts just beca because of a personal interest to, to not just with strength training but any, any anything else that you know i come across might also be helpful for my mom and um and so yeah i mean yeah i mean it it would have been on my mind to some degree this whole time like i said it, it, it with my mom's connection there um definitely more i guess would be the the way that i'd answer that what do you want people to know about slow motion strength training? That's a good question. Slow motion strength training allows a person to get incredible fitness results. I mean, this is going to sound like a marketing commercial and maybe it is, but, but the, but uh, it, it's just the way that it, I think about it is, uh, is it allows a person to get incredible fitness results without having to spend your life in the gym because you know, we often, at least I, you know, I named our company the perfect workout years, you know, over 20 years ago um, with that, with at the time um, with the idea that I think you, you're, that, that people can get better results than just about anything else a person's going to do in the name of exercise. Um, and uh, it's safer on the joints than just about anything else for exercise. And it's uh, super time efficient, you know, 20 minutes twice a week for it to get essentially optimal results. And, um, and uh, over the years, what I've found is that the thing which people usually get most interested in is the time efficiency, at least to try us out for the first time, is the time efficiency, you know, 20 minutes twice a week. Um, and, um, and the better results part um, is almost like, I'm trying to think of the right way of putting it. Um, people oftentimes are even skeptical that you can get any results from 20 minutes. <laughs> so, it's, so, so it's like, why am I even trying to argue that you can get better results than, than you know, most other things in just 20 minutes? Uh, you know, it, so, so that's probably, as I'm sitting here today, that I would probably wouldn't emphasize that because you can you know, get in, look at different studies and arguments and, and try to make, well, gosh, if you spend your life in the gym, might, maybe might you get 4% better results? Maybe. So someone's, a reasonable person could make a reasonable argument like that. But um, even the people that in, in exercise are on the volume side, you know, and I've heard some of them interviewed on this and, and, and have them be pushed, you know, from a high intensity perspective saying, well, okay, if you're just doing one set for exercise training to, you know, what we call muscle success or other people in the exercise industry often call it muscle failure. Um, how much of the results, you know, could you get? And, and, that, and these are proponents of volume. They'll, they'll say on the order of 80%. So in other words, long story short is you're getting, even for people that think you should be spending your, your life in the gym, you know, the vast majority of the results that can be gotten from exercise in just minutes a week, you know, 20 minutes, twice a week. And uh, plus it's safer on your joints, has all these other great benefits that we talk about, you know, for osteoporosis and metabolic benefits and myokines. And there's probably a lot of stuff which we don't, aren't even aware of yet. And so, um, you know, in, increases in basal metabolic rate, which it helps with fat loss and discriminated fat loss and, and, uh, you really can get great, you know, great, great uh, fitness, health and fitness results and don't have to spend your life in the gym. Just a very small, you know, just less than an hour a week. And uh, if you do it right, you, you know, exercise, you know, challenge yourself. <laughs> it's not, I'm not saying the 20 minutes are easy. They're not if you do it right. But, um, but then you'll get incredible results and it won't 
you won't have to spend the rest of your life in the gym. Yeah, Mark Alexander said, uh, you know, there's no magic pill, but this is pretty darn close to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it would be, it would be magic if, um, if it wasn't hard, you know, but, but it's, you know, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, yeah. And uh, having said that, I don't want to get anyone to get, uh, you know, you know, scared away by that or even scared away by my story uh, about like that crazy thing that I did <laughs> on, this, on, this, on this class because um, what the methodology does is basically allows you to push your heart, yourself as hard as you're willing to push yourself. And, um, and, but, it, but it won't force you to push you any, any further than, than you're willing to push yourself. So there's no danger of, you know, thinking, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do this. This sounds way too hard. I mean, it, it's, it's challenging, especially if you want to, you know, get good results, but you challenge yourself as much as you can. And then you won't be challenged anymore beyond that because it's just, you know, it's the right amount for you.